the grid. A digital frontier. I pictured patriots as they moved throughout our country. Do they look like individuals or small business? Were the rallies like church? I keep dreaming of a world I hope to one day see. And then, today, I got in. Hello, fellow Americans. This is Chris Coleman, your host with the Kingdom Patriot Group. Welcome to The Grid, where faith, politics, and commerce intersect. Christian nationalism. It is possible that you are labeled a Christian nationalist and you don't even know it. How would you know? What is it? That is the topic that we cover today on The Grid. But first, a word from our sponsor. Forever 17 is a company that creates beauty elixirs and was co-founded by entrepreneurs Martha and Tammy. Years ago, Martha began a quest to learn how to heal her body naturally. Upon discovering plant-based essential oils and being an amazing culinary artist, she began experimenting with all sorts of unique creations in her kitchen. Facial serums, body butters, balms. With a newfound resolve to walk away from products with ingredients she couldn't pronounce, she embarked on a journey to create wonderful natural elixirs and products that help the skin and begin sharing that with family and friends. Get these products today at forever17.net and see all the products that Martha and Tammy have created for you. Martha and Tammy are patriots who love God and country. By purchasing the best beauty products, you may be turning back the clock on your appearance and supporting an American business with like-minded entrepreneurs. Check out their company at forever17.net. That's forever17.net today. This week's news and review. How do you dig yourself out of a hole? It's often said that the first step, the most important step, the step upon which all things hinge, is to first stop digging. But I say, Mr. Biden, if you want to keep digging, go ahead. We'll see you at the voters booth in November. Shovel One. The administration just announced that on May 23rd, it will be ending Title 42, which gives the public health authority the power to take extraordinary measures to limit the introduction of communicable diseases. Trump invoked this regulation in May of 2020 to stop the introduction of COVID cases at the Texas-Mexican border. My father-in-law lives in Texas, border town, and I can tell you this, it's been a significant entry point for COVID into the state of Texas. Many expect that this will explode immigration into our country. And the hole just goes a little deeper. Shovel two. The DOJ sent a letter to state officials on Transgender Day of Visibility, advising them that blocking transgender and non-binary youth from receiving gender-affirming treatment could violate U.S. law. Wow, that was a mouthful. So this is what they're saying, that to intentionally erect or discriminate by preventing individuals from receiving gender-affirming care implicates a number of federal legal guarantees, Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark wrote in the letter. The DOJ's letter comes after Texas Governor Greg Abbott passed the legislation allowing state agencies to investigate parents for child abuse if they seek gender-affirming care for their children. And then there are other states as well, like Idaho and Alabama, who've signed legislation that requires youth to participate in sports consistent with their birth gender. Wow, that's certainly radical legislation. In regards to Abbott in Texas, you actually need to read the letter. First, he's actually directing the Texas Department of Family Protective Services to enforce existing law. What does that law say? It doesn't say that all gender-affirming therapies are child abuse. It focuses on significant fundamental physical change, including those procedures that are irreversible. Are you kidding me? Do we think that a 12-year-old ought to be able to make a decision regarding their own bodies that can never be reversed? Come on, man. Here's the actual language that ultimately prompted the DOJ's letter. As OAG opinion number KP-0401 makes clear, it is already against the law to subject Texas children to a wide variety of elective procedures for, tran for gender transitioning, including reassignment surgeries that can cause sterilization, mastectomies, removals of otherwise healthy body parts, and administration of puberty-blocking drugs or supra-physiological doses of testosterone or estrogen. That's what it really says. Do we really think that kids ought to be able to make their own decisions? With those kind of procedures, come on. Shovel three, gas, gas, gas. And no, I am not talking about Biden's flatulence when he meets with world leaders. I'm talking about the pump. He's releasing about one third of the strategic oil reserves, but won't open up drilling. I know, I know. They say they've issued the permits, but if you actually read the process and understand the process, it really means nothing. Companies are not free to drill for more domestic oil, pure and simple. So Biden's most important move to deal with this inflation? Yep. You guessed it. Blame Putin. 
Shovel four, inflation. Inflation is holding at historic highs, and the Fed is about to start raising interest rates to combat this. But if that's not enough, if you didn't think it get any worse, you're wrong. These prices are not transient, and they will be with us for a while. And lastly, it's likely we're going to do an entire future podcast on Florida's parents' rights and education bill, a.k.a. don't say gay bill. Because as a listener, the rancor from all sides is reaching fever pitch. And I want you to be informed because we search for the truth here at the Kingdom Patriot Group. However, as a response to this bill, Disney is exposing who they really are. Disney executive and president of Disney General Entertainment content, Carrie Burke, says this, I am the mother of a transgender and pansexual child, and I want at least half of all future characters to be LGBTQIA or racial minorities. In addition, Disney's diversion and inclusion manager, Vivian Ware, announced that theme parks are now banned from saying ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. They're banning this in order to create that magical moment for children who do not identify with traditional gender roles. You know what? Looks like Biden handed Disney a shovel as well, and they're starting to dig. For this week's news and review, that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us for our third and final podcast in the series regarding Christian nationalism. Just as a quick recap, you may remember in the first episode, we covered a couple of audio clips, one from Wretched Radio. If you're a Christian and if you love your country, uh uh-oh, you're a Christian nationalist. This is Wretched Radio. And one from Christians Against Christian Nationalism. I'm a Christian against Christian nationalism. I'm a Christian against Christian nationalism. In both of these clips, we dealt with how the term Christian nationalism is being used and viewed in the public at large. And in the second podcast, we really started to dive into the definition of Christian nationalism, specifically in a very lengthy and robust article from Christianity Today. Well, let's take a moment, and when we get back, we're going to dive into one more clip by a lady named Allie Beth Stuckey, who in a three-minute span really encapsulates this discussion. We'll be right back. Interested in a particular topic that you want us to cover? If so, email us at admin at kingdompatriot.us. That's admin at kingdompatriot.us. We'd love to hear from you today has said, you know, one of the biggest problems that we're seeing in Christianity right now is Christian nationalism. And I've talked about this. Beth Moore said the same thing. There are other evangelical leaders that I think a lot of people would, um, who believe that Christian nationalism is the biggest threat to the church that we have. And all he goes on to say about Christian nationalism, evangelicals nurtured Christian nationalism, Christian nationalists use uh, use that fear and resentment. We brought it on ourselves. And he said in churches across the U.S., many members are falling into one of two camps, Keller said. On one hand, many young evangelicals, particularly those living in cities, almost have a tendency to be overwoke and take their cues from the secular world, talking about Christian nationalists in nasty ways. Uh, he goes on to say that some pastors are saying that Uh, Some people are leaving their churches because they don't talk about justice and about how bad Trump is or how bad Christian uh, nationalism is and because these pastors are not preaching about it. So here's what I think about all of that. Um, I think that there are very few actual Christian nationalists in the evangelical church. Unfortunately, Christian nationalism has been used as a boogeyman in the same way that Marxist or Marxism kind of kind of has been used as a boogeyman. But here's what I'll say. And I understand that because I'm on the conservative side of this, that you might see me as biased in this way. But Marxism is actually much more of a legitimate threat to the evangelical church than Christian nationalism is. And I think we have to define our terms here. So Christian nationalism is so rarely defined by the people who use it. When Beth Moore, for example, said, that our biggest threat is Christian nationalism in the church and it has to do with Trumpism. I asked her on Twitter, hey, can you define, like, what do you mean by this? Like, what is Christian nationalism? And she didn't respond to me. She's not obligated to respond to me, but also I think clarity in defining our terms is really important. And so when you're saying Christian nationalist, are you just saying all conservative Christians? Are you just saying anyone who is patriotic, anyone who loves our country, anyone who believes in religious liberty, anyone who believes that, for example, 
that God is the great moral lawgiver and therefore what he says is good and right and true should be directive for how we should formulate our laws. Is that Christian nationalism? So has every person who has believed in God as the great moral lawgiver, have they all been Christian nationalists? Wow. Those comments by Ali really encapsulate this entire discussion around Christian nationalism. And I think she also, she was really doing the article in response to a famous author and apparently an article that he wrote. So we tried to leave that out because we're really not here to really downgrade anyone. What what we're trying to do is, again, is to define Christian nationalism. We started with what are people saying about it? Is it divisive? How wide is the label? But ultimately, what does it mean? And I think she encapsulates several things. Number one, I think she encapsulated the fact that it's really divisive, that you have these two camps out there. You have the one that tends to be very liberal, very progressive in their faith, almost overwoke. I think it's how it's described. But then you have the other that is the extreme Christian nationalist. Is that how you heard that, Sean? Yes. I thought she did an outstanding job and that she really pulled it all together in a short period of time. In fact, I love the question she asked. She was asking questions. So if we use our faith to help us formulate laws, recognizing that the true morality of laws comes from God, does that make us a Christian nationalist? I I love that question. It was awesome. As I listened to that, did you ever hear her actually give a concrete definition of a Christian nationalist? No. I didn't either. She got fairly close, but again, she's illustrating the fact that it's vague. It's fuzzy at best. That's what I would say. I would. She raised a lot of questions because I think she recognizes that it's such a broad label that if you have faith and if you love country, you're going to be labeled a, a Christian nationalist. Right. Even though some of those things are very righteous. I, I think the misunderstanding around this, now this is just me speaking off the cuff, but I think people picture Christian nationalism more of maybe like England when there was an established religion of the state and it was perverted and clearly biblical principles were not being followed and that Christianity and scripture was being used to justify sin. I mean, that, that there's really no other way to say it. It was being used to justify evil, selfish, sinful people. Is that what we're talking about here? Yeah, I think that you really hit that there. And it reminds me of a movie that I recently saw. I believe the movie was called The Edge of War. And you had two really good friends, two close friends. You had a Brit and a German. There was one scene that really gripped me. And suddenly it's like it made some of the things that are going on in the U.S. with regard to Christians who support Trump. It made it very, very clear. Because in this one scene, you could see the perspective of each of the two young men, and they were seeing the other from their perspective, but not seeing the opposite perspective. The Brit is seeing the actions of Hitler and defining what's going on by his actions. Flip it, the German is seeing Hitler by his words by what he is promising and by the positive way that he's talking about Germany and how Germany can come back and can thrive again. They were looking at Hitler from two completely different perspectives. One was going to make the nation thrive again and sounded like a good thing. On the flip side, the Brit is seeing the actions that Hitler was taking. Both of them valid, but if each of the young men didn't see where the other one was coming from, then they're not going to land on the same page. In fact, it ended up being the argument that separated and destroyed their friendship. You know, I don't want to be over cynical here. Actually, yes, I do. It kind of reminds me of if I had two choices, if I had a choice to follow a leader who was doing everything he could to protect the unborn and along the way sent out a bunch of mean tweets, 
versus the utmost statesman who never said a mean word to anyone but supported laws that expanded the genocide of the unborn. I have no choice but to follow the actions rather than the words. Exactly. I think that one scene helped clearly identify what the problem was when it came to supporting Trump. There were people who were looking at his actions and they were seeing what he was going to do and what he was doing and the success that was being played out. And then you had the other folks that were listening to his rhetoric and they didn't like the fact that he was combative. So what they were seeing, and they, they saw, they could not only see his rhetoric, but they saw his rallies and how so many people, thousands of people were flocking to his rallies. So they were looking at the message and the flock and they were going, oh my gosh, it's Hitler 2.0. Whereas the supporters weren't looking at that, they were looking at the results. The man is making promises and he's working to keep them. And those promises are actually making our country stronger and uh, keeping us free. So at, a, uh, at the risk of sounding self-promoting, please go back and listen to our podcast if you haven't. Uh, it's, a two, it's a two series podcast where we talk about why we voted for Trump and we dive into that in more detail. I think you will find it uh, fruitful and informative. So I think as we get ready to kind of wind this down, Sean, I hear the term Christian nationalism. I've come to the conclusion in our discussion that I do not want to be named or labeled a Christian nationalist, but not because I'm not patriotic. I love God. I love our country. I think I don't want to be a labeled Christian nationalist because of the emotion and the divisiveness that that label invokes. I would concur with that. In fact, if I had to pick a label, just coincidentally, I think the best label would be a kingdom patriot. Oh, I like that. And the reason is because it doesn't matter what country you're in. Be a citizen that fosters the success of your nation, the freedom of your nation, the freedom of your people. So when you say when you say foster the success of your nation, to be content, to be successful in your nation where you're planted. Is there, is there a biblical example of that? Well, yeah. When the, when the uh, children of Israel were taken captive into Babylon, the Lord told them to bloom where they were planted. Be a blessing to their surroundings. And that's what they did. Even if they're in captivity, yeah. which they were. Yeah, because the bad stuff didn't happen until closer to the end of the 400 years. Well, then the oppression began and, you know, that was the ugly stuff. But they did. They took the Lord at his word and they bloomed where they were planted. And that's why they ended up becoming a huge number within Babylon. Well, as we land the plane, I want to take that thought, Sean, and just share a little bit. A lot of people don't know this if they haven't been to our website at kingdompatriot.us or looked at even the logo closely, if you look at our seal, you will see a couple of very distinct things. You'll see an eagle in that seal. And in the middle of it, you'll see us like a square shield with a cross in it. And above both, you will see a crown. And I want to take a minute and explain that because I want to make sure that the work that we're doing as we push this country back, as we desire for this country to return its Judeo-Christian roots, not so we can promote a an oppressive state of religion but so that we can honor God, that we can honor God in the way that we go about self-governance. And that is to look at that seal. And that sh seal shows us our eagle represents our country. We know that the eagle is, is our emblem. It's, it, it, it represents a lot. But in the middle of that, we know that our country doesn't exist without the heart of Christ. Our country is never becomes what it is today without those principles that we find that Jesus gave us. But regardless of what happens with our country, this country is under the authority of God's kingdom. That's what that crown represents. There is no authority, authority on earth that's been established that God has not granted it to have. So even as we promote these things, I want you to know that I'm a patriot second. I am a Christian first. And no matter whether we end up in captivity or whether we end up in oppression, we will still be sharing a lot of the same things. But the most important thing is that you, for the listener, 
is to know Jesus. So good. So good. I didn't know if you had anything to add to that. Well, what I would add to that is that you did not know I was going to say anything (laughs) about the name of our organization. We didn't talk about that, but as you were talking and as we've been going back and forth, I just kept thinking about the fact that the name of the organization actually really says it all about where we stand. It really does. And I remember we debated back and forth and back and forth and back and forth what the name of our organization would be. And I'm so glad we settled where we did. We had lots of debates. We did. (laughs) Well, Sean, I hesitate to say this has been a lot of fun. It's always fun co-hosting a podcast with you. The subject is weighty. It's challenging. It's very difficult. So when I say I hesitate to say it's fun, it's just because of the weightiness of the topic. But doing the podcast with you is a lot of fun. I think you have a lot of wisdom and a lot of insight that is really beneficial to our listeners. I thank you for joining me today. I hope we do a lot more of these. It really invites just robust conversation. Is there anything that you would like to leave our listeners with today? Well, I really like uh, the approach that we've taken, and I, I really do think that the bottom line is for the term Christian nationalist, I think it is a label that is strategically used by an individual to either shut down a very truthful point or to shut down the messenger. So we need to be very careful about using the term Christian nationalist. And I think that the folks, that get that label slapped on them hardly ever use it. They probably don't use it themselves. So be weary of the motivation of someone who is using the term Christian nationalist on another believer. Thanks again to our sponsor, Forever 17. Visit www.forever17.net to get your Turn Back the Clock beauty elixirs today, and you will be supporting Martha and Tammy. Don't forget to visit our website at kingdompatriot.us to join the movement of faith and freedom. That's kingdompatriot.us. Join today so that together we can make a difference. Your membership is appreciated. Your input is valued. Your voice is needed. I'm Chris Coleman, and I am a Kingdom Patriot. 